Did I ever tell you about the occasion on which, to my utter amazement, I saw what I can only explain as a ghost, a very traditional, very normal ghost. It began like this. A long time ago, when I was a young teacher, I worked at Gamlingay Village College in Cambridgeshire, and the village colleges were run by a warden who was in charge of both adult education and the school education, a deputy head who really ran the school, and a further education tutor who was responsible for the adult education and the youth work, the youth clubs and so on. I was working as the further education tutor and my pal Bill Farrow was the head of the science department. Brilliant scientist and you wouldn't find a better colleague anywhere. He was a colleague and a friend and we had that sort of close relationship where Bill was the honorary uncle to my kids and I was the honorary uncle to his and it was as if we really were brothers. And I was moved away, I got promoted and took other jobs. It wasn't for a long, long time afterwards that I heard from Bill again. He would then have been over 70. And he phoned me and said, would you be able to come over to Cambridge to see me? He said, I've retired now. And he said, I've just been told that I've got six weeks to live. And I said, Bill, the minute I can get away, I'll be over to see you. Of course I will. And for the next six weeks, I went over to Cambridge from Cardiff here every weekend and spent as much time as I could with him. And the terminal illness that was destroying him made him so weak and so ill that it was heartbreaking to see a grand old friend in that condition. Then I got a phone call from his village priest, Father Ian, who said he was very sorry to tell me that Bill had passed over and that one of the last things he had asked was for Ian to call me to go over to Cambridge to conduct his funeral. And I said to Ian, yes, of course I will. I'd have done anything for Bill. And he said, well, I've arranged it for the following Friday could you get over Thursday night and we can run through the service together and decide which parts each of us will do? And I said, yes, of course, Ian. So I finished a day's work in Cardiff, drove over to Cambridge, got there. I'd warned Ian it would be late, got there about midnight. And there we were in Ian's study in the rectory and going through, if you could imagine, two priests with prayer books open at the funeral pages. Well, if I read this prayer, will you do that reading? And then I'll read the next prayer. And we were just planning how we were going to share the service. And I saw Bill. He looked as he had looked when we were young teachers together. He looked radiantly happy, healthy, no trace of the illness. But he looked as real and solid as Ian. It was just as if he was there in the flesh once again, but many years younger. And he gave me a great big smile. He'd always had a mischievous sense of humour and said, tell Ian that Lady Juliana was absolutely right. And then he vanished. And I thought, whatever is Ian going to think if I tell him, because he had seen and heard nothing, if I tell him that I have just seen Bill's spirit, that he looked radiantly happy and healthy and young again, and he wanted me to tell him, Ian, that Lady Juliana was absolutely right. And I thought, he'll think I'm coming off the wall. And then I thought, no. Damn it, if this had been the other way round, Bill would have done this for me without a second's hesitation. So I drew a deep breath and I said, Ian, I'm sorry that this sounds strange, but I have just seen Bill. He looked wonderful, young, strong, healthy, radiating happiness. And he asked me to tell you that Lady Juliana was absolutely right. 
I thought Ian was just going to shrug his shoulders and say, I'm sorry, old chap, doesn't mean anything. He didn't. He nearly fell off his chair, gasped for breath, and it took him two or three minutes to speak. Then he said, you can't have known that. And then he explained. He had been with Bill in intensive care a matter of minutes before Bill passed over. And he said, the last thing I told Bill was the story of Lady Juliana, Saint Juliana of Norwich, who had had a vision of heaven. And the other nuns had clustered round her because they thought she was going to fall. Her eyes had gone blank as though her spirit had left her body. And she recovered and said, no, no, my sisters, I, I'm not ill. I have seen heaven. And of course, the first question that anyone would ask, what is it like? And Lady Juliana said, in an ecstasy of happiness, all shall be well and all shall be well and all manner of things shall be well. And Ian said, that was the last thing that I told Bill before he slipped away. He said, you've just driven 300 miles to tell me that you've seen him, that he looked radiantly happy and healthy again in his absolute prime, and that he wants me to know that Juliana was right. He is in heaven, and it is a place of wonderful, indescribable happiness. Well, if you can imagine two priests sitting together, going through a funeral book and looking at each other as if they were just qualifying for Madame to Swords. And finally, Ian decided, got up, walked to his wine cabinet and said, before we do any more, Father, I think we need half a bottle of this each. And so we did, and we conducted the funeral the following morning. We come across the very strange mystery of John Chapman, and this is one of the best documented accounts of someone apparently seeing the future. John Chapman, who was better known as the Peddler of Swatham, and that's the town where I went to school, and in the middle of Swatham is a town sign which shows John Chapman, the Peddler, accompanied by his dog, and we're back in the 14th or 15th centuries. And John had a mysterious dream, which told him that if he went to London and stood on London Bridge, he would hear news that would make him immensely rich and powerful. Now, John was a peddler, and if he wasn't out peddling his goods every day, he and his wife didn't have much to eat that week. And so, although there was a bit of a domestic argument about it, John was so determined by this foretaste that he'd had in his dream of receiving great news on London Bridge, that despite the argument with his wife, he set out walking to London. Well, that's a good hundred miles, and you can imagine it took him practically a week to do it on foot, faithful dog trotting beside him. Gets to London Bridge, stands there, and of course in those days there were houses on the bridge. And after he'd been there for two days, one of the householders came out, very suspicious, and said, what are you hanging about for? Are you a thief? Are you waiting to see when people leave their houses unattended? No, no, said John, I'm, I'm not. And he explained, I've had this strange dream that if I came and stood on London Bridge, I would hear news that would make me rich and famous. And the man he was talking to laughed and said, if I was such a fool as you, I would have been on my way to a little town called Swatham. He said, I've heard that in the garden of one of the local peddlers is a great crock of Roman gold. He said, I'm not such a fool as to believe that. It was only a stupid dream. John took his time before leaving 
and then went at top speed back home. He got home in about four days instead of a week. Arrived home in the middle of the night, rouses his wife and says, bring a lamp and a spade, we're going to dig under the apple tree. She is even more amazed than she was when he suddenly set off for London, but loyal and loving couple and she duly comes with the spade and the lantern, gives John the spade, he starts to dig and three or four feet down he encounters a Roman potsherd full of gold Roman coins and changed their lives completely. But there was something written on the potherd in a language John couldn't read. Guessed it might be Latin and they set it in the window of their cottage because from time to time students from Cambridge would come into Swatham for a rest and a holiday and he hoped that somebody might see it and come and tell him about it. And sure enough, they did. One of the young Cambridge students knocked on uh, John's door and said, where did you get that very interesting pot? Did you realize it's Roman? And John pretends to be completely ignorant and oh, don't know where it came from. I just found it on my travels a long way from here. And the student said, that's a pity because what it says on the pot is under me lies a greater. As soon as he got rid of them, John and his wife back in the garden digging and they unearthed the second pot crammed with Roman gold and about twice the size of the first one. The best thing that can be said about John Chapman is that he was a good and kindly man remembering his years of hard work and poverty. He built almshouses, he endowed the church, did all kinds of good and generous things with the money that he'd found as a result of that strange dream, that time slip dream, which had taken him into the future. These time slips, if that's what they are, seem to have been going on not only for centuries, but for millennia. For example, there was the Roman legion that just seemed to have disappeared. This was the ninth Spanish legion and the year was 120 AD. And the entire legion seems to have vanished. Now it's one thing for an old age pensioner to get involved in a, a minor time slip in a modern city, but for an entire Roman legion to march, as it were, out of time instead of out of space presents a rather more sombre mystery. And then, of course, there's the very strange case, and again I refer back to my notes, of the um, experience that Sir Robert Victor Goddard had in 1935 at the Drem Airport. He flew over it, expecting it to be as it was when he had last been informed about it, largely abandoned and derelict. And what he saw was the airport as it was going to be after the outbreak of the Second World War. So he saw it five years ahead of the time that he actually flew over it. Did I ever tell you about the very strange events that happened when I was filming a series for television which was called Castles of Horror and among the many places that the crew visited was Wevelsburg which was the place where Himmler and the SS had had their headquarters but where in early times 13th 14th centuries the castle had been associated with witchcraft and black magic and down in the lowest of the dungeons various witches had 
practice their skills. We had done the general piece uh, about the castle and uh, uh, my cameraman and sound engineer who were top class professionals as well as being good personal friends and colleagues had taken all the shots they needed except for the very top room. Now Wavelsburg is a very curious castle. It's not rectangular, it's triangular. And we went up together to this top room where the SS had apparently dabbled in some strange kind of black magic because there were all kinds of weird magical ornaments, masks, pictures, objects around the walls and a very curious atmosphere in that room. Now my cameraman and my sound engineer said as well as being personal friends and very good professional colleagues were what I would call sensible, practical men. And yet when we entered that upper chamber with all its weird magical objects around the walls, both of them became disquiet, um, anxious, and actually said to me, Lionel, can we get this in one shot? We do not like it up here. And it was so unusual coming from such friends who were practical and, as I said, highly intelligent professionals. We got through the lines in the one shot and they were so keen to pack their gear and get down off that floor. It was only in that top floor that it happened. Now, because in the course of my work over the years, I have done a number of exorcisms, I rather feel that whatever spiritual abilities any of us may have, and they all differ, some people are highly sensitive and I'm not and others become exorcists and what one might perhaps term sort of psychic warriors. But whatever it was in that upper room wasn't affecting me. It was almost as if it was backing away from me and it was certainly having a very serious impact on my two professional team friends. And what could it have been? Was it that this weird magic symbolism that the SS under Himmler had actually used in Wavelsburg? Was it somehow that the sufferings of some of their victims would have been absorbed? Because this is one of the theories about what we describe as ghosts, that when there has been a particularly dark emotional event, a, a murder or a suicide, that some of the tragic feeling of the victim of that event somehow percolates its way into the fabric of the building, the walls, the furniture. And for anybody who is sensitive, who visits that room years afterwards, feels what was experienced by the victim of the original situation. I've never been back to Wavelsburg since, but I would certainly like to go back, accompanied by one or two medium friends, and see if they could tell me exactly what was wrong in that room. But there was something there which was genuinely frightening to my cameraman and my sound engineer. But whatever it was, it didn't get to me. I can't explain it, but it was a very strange room.
Did I ever tell you about the mystery of the old age pensioner who had been shopping in Norwich and who apparently became the victim of a time slip? This is what happened. It happened years ago when I was living there and working as the deputy head of Helsden High School, which was one of the Norwich comprehensives. Two old pensioners had parked their car in Cathedral Close near a rather quaint Victorian toilet which was for gentlemen only and you had to descend the stairs in order to use it. The old lady sitting in the car was waiting for her husband to come back from having descended the stairs to this old Victorian toilet and time passed and he didn't return. She became increasingly anxious in case he had fallen on the stairs or had a heart attack or been taken ill and called a traffic warden who was a very friendly and helpful man. She explained her anxiety about her husband and he said, I'll go down and have a look for you, madam. Down the toilet steps he goes, searches the three little cubicles which were uh, the uh, sort of full toilets at the bottom as well as having a urinal wall there was nobody there. Comes back and tells the lady in the car, I have searched it thoroughly and there's no sign of anyone, nobody who's been taken ill or collapsed. And the lady was totally at a loss. She said, I didn't see him coming out again. And time passed, another five minutes, another ten minutes, and he appeared at the top of the steps where the traffic warden had said there was nobody underneath got into the car and said, just get my breath back, love, I'll tell you in a minute. And when he'd recovered sufficiently to tell her what had happened, he said this, I used the toilet, came up the steps in the normal way, you weren't here. The car wasn't here, but on the adjacent road there were cars of a design I have never seen passing silently along that top road. And he said, and my guess was that they all had electric engines. He said, I couldn't understand what had happened. And then I remembered having read years ago in science fiction story about someone who had been involved in a time slip, that by retracing his steps, he'd got back to his proper time. So I went back down the steps, waited for a few moments, came up again, and everything was normal. You were here, my car was here, and there was no sign of this strange phenomenon. Now, what do we make of a story like that? What had really happened to the gentleman who used that old Victorian toilet just uh, outside Norwich Cathedral? The only possible explanation seems to be that time for him had slipped and he'd been projected into the future and fortunately for him having read the science fiction story in which by retracing your steps and trying to reenact what had happened to you you could get back to your own time and of course that story raises all kinds of intriguing questions what is time what are the theories of time? Is it, as some of the great physicists have argued, a fourth dimension? Is it possible that we experience time inside ourselves, that it is a subjective experience? Shakespeare says that time goes at different speeds. Sometimes it walks, sometimes it runs. The happier we are, the faster it goes, the more miserable we are, the slower it goes. So is it subjective or objective? Is there any way that we can tr control it? Is there any way that we can travel through it? There are so many cases of mysterious appearances and disappearances. There's Caspar Hauser in Nuremberg just turned up in the town square. Had he been a victim of a time slip, apart from the other explanations that were put forward later? 
And those mysterious disappearances, somebody just vanishes. Like Benjamin Bathurst, who had been a diplomat during the Napoleonic Wars. Ben Bathurst just got out of the inn where he'd been staying. His secretary, valet, assistant, was holding the coach door open for him. Ben walked around the heads of the horses and was never seen again. Did he fall into a time slip? It would be interesting to know if somebody ever appears at a different time calling himself Ben Bathurst.